Ms. Stefanik. Thank you to both of our witnesses for your service today. Um, Ms. Cooper, I wanted to start with you. You spoke eloquently of the threat of Russia when it illegally annexed Crimea, how that's a threat not only to Ukraine, but it's also a threat to Europe and the United States, a national security challenge. And I sit on the House Armed Services Committee. We know that the most important support for Ukraine in terms of lethal defensive aid is in the forms of javelins. Would you agree with that? Yes, ma'am. And which administration were those javelins made available to Ukraine? This administration, the Trump administration. And not the Obama administration. That is correct. Um, both of you, have you ever spoken with the president about Ukraine aid? No, I have not. No, ma'am. Um, Under Secretary Hale, you testified that you had no direct knowledge of any nefarious motivations to withhold aid to Ukraine, correct? Correct. And to your knowledge, you testified that there were no strings attached to the aid, correct? That's page 184 of your deposition. Yeah, no such knowledge. And more specifically, you testified that you had no knowledge of Ukraine aid being held up for investigations. Is that correct? Correct. During the temporary hold of security assistance, this was until Ambassador Taylor sent you the cable, you had never even heard the words Burisma or Biden, correct? Well, in the context of what we're discussing, uh, correct. Great. You testified that on page 96. And ultimately, as we know, the aid was released to Ukraine, correct? Yes, I read that. Now, let's talk about the context broadly of this hold. You testified that it's not just Ukraine, that there were, in fact, other countries whose security assistance was on hold. Quote, the aid package to Lebanon was also being held in the same fashion, correct? Correct and foreign aid was held from northern triangle countries of South America, correct? Uh, of Central America, correct. Central America. And you also testified that when you served as ambassador to Pakistan, security assistance was also held uh, for their failure to conform to our concerns regarding terrorists and other issues on the Afghan-Pakistan border. Correct. You know, basically, let's broadly talk about the context of all of these holds on aid. When we talk about aid, I always think about these are hard-earned taxpayer dollars. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. And isn't it correct that this administration, the Trump administration, has been conducting a foreign assistance review to reestablish norms that guide the assistance uh, as we provide aid overseas? That's correct. You testified that this review had been going on for quite a while, and the administration did not want to take a business-as-usual approach to foreign assistance, a feeling that once a country has received a certain assistance package, it's something that continues forever. And you continued, the program had to be evaluated that they were actually worthy beneficiaries of our assistance, that our program made sense, that we avoid nation-building strategies, and that we provide assistance to countries that are that are lost in terms of our policy to our adversaries. Is that correct? That's correct. And you testified that you warmly welcomed this assistance review. Correct. Um, and again, just, just to get this on record and for the millions of Americans viewing, security assistance was in fact released to Ukraine. I know I've already asked this, but this is a really important point. Correct. Thank you, I yield back. Mr. Swallow. Ms. Cooper, your testimony today destroys two of the pillars of the president's defense and one justification for his conduct. First pillar, no harm, no foul. The Ukrainians didn't know that the hold was in place, so it didn't really hurt them. Second pillar, this president was a real champion of anti-corruption. and He cared about corruption in Ukraine. So I want to go through your new testimony today. It's your testimony now that after an employee came forward to you, you believe you have some evidence that the Ukrainians first inquired about security assistance to someone in your office on July 25 of this year. Is that right? That's correct. And July 25 is also the day that President Trump officially talked to President Zelensky where investigations of the Bidens were brought up. Is that right? Sir, I only know what has been reported uh, publicly on this. And that was reported, is that right? That's correct. Second, this president, as a champion of anti-corruption, your testimony today is that on May 23, 
you certified that as far as it related to your duties, Ukraine had met the corruption concerns for the aid to be released. Is that right? Yes, sir, the Defense Department certified. And after that date, inexplicably, the President of the United States puts a hold on security assistance. Is that right? That was what I heard in July, yes. Now, this anti-corruption president, who cares so much about rooting out corruption in Ukraine, did he ever call you after he put the hold to say, Ms. Cooper, what's going on in Ukraine? No, sir. Ambassador Hale, did he ever call you to ask about an update on Ukraine corruption? No, sir. To your knowledge, did he ever call your boss, Secretary Pompeo? I don't know. Ms. Cooper, did he ever call the many bosses that you've had at the Department of Defense? The secretaries know, or acting secretaries? I, I don't know, sir. Now as to the justification. The justification is that the Obama administration only provided blankets so the Ukrainians should be grateful, even after being shaken down that the Trump administration provided more. But the truth, Ms. Cooper, is that under the Obama administration and the European Reassurance Initiative, $175 million were provided from U.S. taxpayer dollars to the Ukrainians. Is that right? Sir, I don't have that figure. The figure that we typically use is to say we've provided $1.6 billion to date. And, and I, we've, you know, but I don't have the breakdown in front of me. And the Obama administration also trained five military battalions of the Ukrainians. Is that correct? Again, I don't have the figures in front of me, but yes, the training program began in the Obama administration and, and we did train many forces. And under the Obama administration founded Ukrainian security assistance initiative provided to the Ukrainians were armored Humvees, tactical drones, night vision devices, armored vests, and medical equipment. Is that correct? These all sound like uh, pieces of equipment that were provided uh, in the Obama administration, to my recollection. You'd agree that's a lot more than blankets, right? Yes, sir. Ambassador Hale, the aid that was withheld to Lebanon and Pakistan, those were for legitimate foreign policy objectives. Is that right? I would say that's true. The assistance to Pakistan, I've not heard an explanation for the uh, current hold on the Lebanese program. And you would agree that withholding aid to investigate a political opponent is not a legitimate foreign policy objective. Is that right? Correct. So I guess we can agree that even Bernie Madoff made charitable contributions, but it doesn't make him a good guy. Ms. Cooper, your testimony today demonstrates the power of coming forward and defying lawless orders from the president. Because you came forward and testified, we learned this new information, which destroys a central defense that the Republicans have put forward. Because Ambassador Taylor came forward, one of his employees learned this defense from the Republicans that all we had was hearsay evidence. And Mr. Holmes said, actually, I heard the President of the United States tell Ambassador Sondland, where are we with the investigations? Your courage has aided this investigation despite the President's continued obstruction. And I yield back. Mr. Hurd. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Ambassador Hale. <clears throat> You're, in essence, the number three guy at the State Department, is that correct? Correct. You represent roughly 70,000 folks? I, or you, you I would say I represent them. I'm part of them. Part I'm of one them. of them, yes. Um, well, you, where you are part of a pretty fantastic workforce that I've been proud to be able to serve a, alongside. We, we share a time together in, in, in Pakistan. Um, and so thank them. I know they oftentimes don't get the... Um, pats on the back or the accolades for what they do for our national security, um, but there's some of us that do recognize that and, and appreciate that. Um, did anybody raise issues to you, Ambassador Hale, about investigations, the Bidens or Burisma? No, sir. Thank you. Um, Ms. Cooper, you have a great staff. I don't think my staff would have read my 115-page um, deposition and gave me feedback. So uh, give them give them gold stars. Um, 
You said you, in, your, in your deposition, and you just confirmed with my colleague from, from California that you certified on 23 May that the Ukraine aid for the, the review of the depart their, their defense um, you know, industry and Department of Defense you know, was passed the corruption test. Is that correct? Sir, I think the wording was more along the lines of uh, progress has been made or sufficient progress has been made. Um, it didn't. It didn't reference any kind of an anti-corruption test per se. Um, did this change, or was there a reevaluation with a new president coming in? Because President Zelensky was inaugurated in office two days before that date. Did that have an impact on how he was going to continue some of those some of those pieces? Was that taken into account in this review? Not prior to May twenty third. No, sir. So the review was basically done on the previous, the efforts done by the previous Poroshenko administration. Yes, sir, although it's important to note that the review related most specifically to the Ministry of Defense. Sure, sure, but there were ultimately changes under the, under the Zelensky regime, is that correct? Yes, sir, there's a new Minister of Defense. Um, can you explain, I know FMF, Foreign Military Financing and State Departments, but can you explain the difference between FMF and USAI funding and, uh, and also how the Ukrainians get um, um, lethal aid? I'm sorry, could you repeat the last part of that? Also, how the Ukrainians... Actually get lethal aid, because is lethal aid covered under one of these two buckets? So, um, there are three separate pieces to our overall mm. ability to provide equipment to the Ukrainian armed forces. The first is the foreign military finance system, which is um, a, a State Department authority, mm. and countries around the world have this authority. That authority is used for some of the training um, and equipment. There's also the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative. That's a DOD authority. Unlike the state authority, the DOD authority is only a one-year authority. Um, and then third, there's the opportunity for uh, defense sales. And that is something that we're working with the Ukrainians on now so that they can actually purchase U.S. equipment. But is the Javelin specifically was provided under FMF initially, and now uh, the Ukrainians are interested in the purchase of Javelin. And there wasn't a hold put on purchasing of equipment, is that correct? Not to my understanding, no. Can I ask you a non-impeachment inquiry question, Ms. Cooper? A non-what? A non-impeachment inquiry question. Sir, my time is yours. What can we be doing to help the Ukrainians defend against Russian electronic warfare? What more can we be doing to help the Ukrainians defend against elect uh, electronic warfare by the Russians? Good question. Well, what I can say in an open hearing is that there actually is some uh, electronic warfare detection uh, equipment that is included in the USAI package. So there, there's a piece of capability that we're already working to provide them. I think this specific topic, though, is more suitable for a, a closed door session. That's a good copy. Thanks for both of y'all's service um, to our country. And Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Castro. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you all for your testimony today. Uh, I want us to make an important distinction here because a few of my colleagues have rattled off countries where we've actually held up aid. Uh, there is a big distinction between holding up aid for a legitimate policy reason, foreign policy reason, and holding up aid because it's part of a shakedown. Because it's in the service of a president who asks for a political favor of a country to go investigate a political rival. Uh, I think that's important for us to note. And I want to ask you, um, Ms. Cooper, you said that the money was cleared to go by the DOD on May 23rd, is that right? That's correct. And it didn't get released until September 11th? Yes, I should just clarify the, um, the second half of the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative was notified to Congress on, I believe it was May 23rd, and then there was a, a waiting period um, for congressional approval, and then after that point, so in kind of mid-June, um, roughly, it was available for... So perhaps 90 days or so, 95 days, something like that. I, yes, I don't have sure. the calendar in front of me, but that sounds right. Well, you both testified 
that the hold on security assistance was not in the national security interest of the United States and that the hold might embolden Russia. We've heard the same from numerous other witnesses that have come before us. But this was not the only issue with the hold, right? We understand that people within the United States government had significant concerns about the legality of the hold as it relates to the Impoundment Control Act. This is because the money had been authorized by Congress and signed into law by President Trump. Ms. Cooper, at the July meetings, were there any discussions about whether the hold could be implemented in a legal fashion? So in the July 26th meeting, uh, my leadership raised the question of how the president's guidance could be implemented and proffered that perhaps a reprogramming action would be the way to do this, but that more research would need to be done. So then after that discussion, um, we had a lower level discussion at my level on the 31st of July. And let me ask you about that July 31st meeting. Uh, based on your conversations with colleagues at the DOD at the July 31st interagency meeting, did you share your understanding of the legal, legal mechanisms that were available at that time? Yes, sir. And what were they? I expressed that it was my understanding that there were two ways that we would be able to implement presidential guidance to uh, stop obligating the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative. And the first option would be for the president to do a rescission. The second is um, a reprogramming action that the Department of Defense would do. And both of those would require congressional notice. Yes, sir. There would be an extra step that the president would have to take to notify Congress. As far as you know, was there ever any notice that was sent out to Congress? Sir, um, I did express that it, that I believed it would require a notice to Congress right. and that then there was no such notice to my knowledge or preparation of such a notice to my knowledge. And as far as you know, there was never any official rescission or reprogramming of that money? No, sir, not to my knowledge. Instead, what happened was OMB devised an alternative solution involving creative footnotes to implement the whole. And there came a time in August when the Department of Defense no longer supported these unusual footnotes because of concerns that there might not be sufficient time for DOD to obligate the funds before the end of the fiscal year in violation of the Impoundment Control Act. So despite DOD's concerns in mid-August about the Impoundment Control Act and OMB's footnotes, the hold nevertheless continued through September 11th, even after, now as an aside, this is even after the whistleblower had come forward. Is that right? It is correct that the hold was released on September 11th, yes. Well, I know I and many of us here share DOD's concerns about the legality of the hold. And I want to thank you, Ms. Cooper, for voicing DOD's concerns to the White House and pursuing the national security interests of the United States. I yield back. Mr. Radcliffe. Hey, Chairman. Um, Ms. Cooper, based on the new emails that you mentioned in your opening and then subsequent uh, declarations by some of my Democratic colleagues uh, that those emails were evidence that the Ukrainians were aware of a military hold on July 25th, there's now reporting out there saying that Pentagon official reveals Ukrainians asked about stalled security aid. Um, it's, it's being widely reported that uh, Ukraine asked about the hold on military aid on July 25th. That's not what I heard from you. Is that correct? Sir, my exact words were that one email said that the Ukrainian embassy and the House Foreign Affairs Committee are asking about security assistance. 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 Not hold. And then the second email was... The Hill knows about the FMF situation to an extent, and so does the Ukrainian embassy. Those are the exact words. And what do security assistance and FMF situation in these emails mean? I don't want to speculate on what it means. Right. They don't necessarily mean hold, correct? Not necessarily. And isn't it true that around the same time, OMB put a hold on 15 State Department and USAID accounts, including FMF? I don't know that specific detail. But you can't say one way or another whether the inquiries in these emails were about the hold. Is that fair? 
I cannot say for certain. All right, and you can't say one way or another whether the Ukrainians knew about the hold before August 28, 2019, when it was reported in Politico, correct? Sir, I can just tell you that it's the recollection of my staff that they likely knew, but no, I do not have a certain data point to offer you. Well, it's not unusual, is it, um, Ms. Cooper, for uh, foreign countries to inquire about foreign aid that they're expecting from the United States, is it? Sir, in my experience with the Ukrainians, they typically would call about specific things, not just generally checking in on their assistance package. Are you aware that President Zelensky on uh, October 10th, in response to questions from more than 300 reporters over the course of the afternoon, stated that he was not aware and had no knowledge of a hold on security assistance during the time of his July 25th phone call with President Trump? I believe I saw that media reporting, yes. I yield back. Mr. Heck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you both for being here this evening. Uh, Ambassador Hale, last week the country watched as President Trump attacked and intimidated uh, your colleague. He attempted to intimidate your colleague, Ambassador Yovanovitch, who is, of course, a witness to this proceeding. And subsequently, Secretary Pompeo declined to condemn that attack. Bluntly put, I think Secretary's, Secretary Pompeo's uh, silence is nothing less than a betrayal of the men and the women whom he swore an oath to lead. And it's, it's a betrayal that has long-term consequences to uh, attracting and retain, retaining workforce to their morale, to their effectiveness, and to their overall strength. So, Ambassador Hale, I want to give you an opportunity to now do what Secretary Pompeo did not do, either in March of 2019 when the vicious smear campaign kind of got kicked into high gear and you, sir, rightfully pressed for a strong statement in support of her, or last week when the president and his son attacked her, attacked her again. I'm offering you the opportunity to reaffirm to this committee and the millions of Americans, hopefully, who are watching, that Marie Yovanovitch is a dedicated and courageous patriot, and that she served with grace and dignity even in the face of that orchestrated and unsubstantiated smear attack against her. Ambassador Hale, I'm giving you the opportunity to demonstrate leadership. I'm giving you the opportunity to send a clear and resounding message to the men and women who serve in dangerous foreign posts throughout the globe that what happened to Marie Yovanovitch was wrong. Ambassador Hale, the floor is yours. Thank you, Congressman. <clears throat> Excuse me, I endorse entirely your description of Ambassador Yovanovitch. Um, I only met her when I took this job, uh, but immediately I understood that we had an exceptional officer doing exceptional work at a very critical embassy in Kyiv. Um, and during my visit to Kyiv, I was very impressed by what she was doing there to the extent that I asked her if she'd be willing to stay, if that was a possibility, because we had a gap coming up. I support and believe in the institution and the people of the State Department. I am one of them. I have been for 35 years. Uh, all of us are committed to America's national security, and we are the best group of diplomats anywhere in the world. And that support extends to all state officers who have testified before this committee. If I may, I'd like to read a letter that the Under Secretary for Management wrote on November 18 to the ranking member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in response to a communication from him. A number of department employees have testified before the House of Representatives during its inquiry regarding Ukraine. No employee has faced any adverse action by the department for testimony before Congress on this matter. The department will not discipline any department employee for appearing before Congress in response to a subpoena. The department has also proactively established a program to provide financial assistance with respect to private counsel legal fees incurred by department employees. 
there's additional information, but that's the essence of the message. Ambassador Hale, then, therefore, are you saying Marie Ivanovich is a dedicated and courageous patriot? I endorse what you say exactly. I think and that, that she is. served with grace and dignity in the face of the smear campaign? Yes, she did. And that what happened to her was wrong? I believe that she should have been able to stay at post and continue to do the outstanding work. And what happened doing. to her was wrong? That's right. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you for clarifying the record, because I wasn't sure where it was that she could go to set the record straight, if it wasn't you, sir, or where she could go to get her good name and reputation back, if it, weren't, if it wasn't you, sir. Indeed, I want to encourage you in the strongest terms possible. Stand your ground. America's security and strength and prosperity is predicated in no small part on the professionalism of our Foreign Services Corps. And they need to know that you, as the highest ranking professional diplomat in the entire State Department, have their back, sir. Thank you for having Ambassador Yovanovitch's back this evening. And with that, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Ms. Cooper, the, um, who, who, uh, why did the Office of Management and Budget uh, put a hold on the funds? Sir, the only uh, information that I received was from uh, the Office of Management and Budget that they were operating at the direction of the President, and they reported that he had concerns about corruption. That is all that I knew. All right, you put that in your testimony. The President had directed the Office of Management and Budget to hold the funds because of his concerns about corruption in Ukraine. Very legitimate reason. You agree? That is the this, the statement that the president uh, reportedly made, as reported to me by the Office of Management and Budget. And then you said in your testimony that based on recommendations from me and other key DOD advisors, the Department of Defense, in coordination with the Department of State, certified in May of 2019 that Ukraine had taken the steps necessary, and you certified the release of the dollars. Is that accurate? That is correct, sir. But there was. You know, there was a small change in Ukraine in the spring of 2019, wasn't there? Yes, sir. Yeah, and can you elaborate on what that change was? The government of, uh, well, President Zelensky was elected to government. Yeah, you got a brand new guy coming in. In fact, he had just been, I believe, sworn in the day you approved the, the dollars. Was it May 23rd? I think he was sworn in on, I guess it was a couple days before. But there's sort of a sort of a change in circumstances that it seemed to me would warrant at least maybe a second look, um, and that's exactly what played out for a short time, less than two months, 55 days. The our government evaluated the new situation, pretty radical change. You got a new government. Um, in fact, the previous one. We've heard all kinds of things from, from the Democrats about the prosecutor general and the Poroshenko regime, Mr. Lutsenko, and how bad he was. So it took a while for that, to, that all to happen. New president's sworn in. Two months later, the new Congress comes in, takes them a while to, it's not until September, September 5th, that they get rid of this prosecutor. And just a few days later, the aid actually gets released. Um, but the Democrats got all kinds of other things they want to talk about. But the, the, the way this played out seems to me as logical as you can, you can do it. And particularly when you put it in the broader framework of where this president is on concern about foreign aid, his deep-rooted concern in the corruption issue in Ukraine, the experience he had with high-ranking Ukrainian officials criticizing him and supporting Secretary Clinton in the 2016 election. Put all that together, sort of, I think, shows why it played out the way it did. That I would yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Welch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Under Secretary Hill, I want to go back uh, to your support uh, in affirmation of Ambassador Yovanovitch. What I understand, and, and by the way, thank you for that. 
you know, our military leaves nobody on, no soldier on the, the battlefield, and I think uh, those who are in leadership positions in the State Department and our intelligence community have that bond of loyalty to each other, and it's uh, very reassuring uh, that you represent that. You first, as I understand it, uh, got information about her situation uh, in March. Uh, by early March, Secretary Pompeo had mentioned that sometime in the fall he'd received a letter from a former member of Congress with complaints about the ambassador, correct? And that, correct. Member, that member of Congress was? Uh, Congressman Sessions. And did you see that there was any basis to the claims of disloyalty? And no, I did not, nor did the Secretary of State. All right. And you visited Kiev, and you discussed, in fact, extending Ambassador Ivanovich's term until uh, to remain at her post, right? It was a personal idea of mine, yes. Uh, obviously, an indication that you valued her continued service there. And you also stated to the uh, Ukrainian press that Ambassador Yovanovitch represents the President of the United States here in the Ukraine and America stands behind her statements, obviously trying to give her some public support, correct? Correct. Uh, and yet weeks later, the President and Mr. Giuliani unleashed what can only be characterized as an ugly smear campaign to, uh, to, to oust her. Uh, what was your reaction to the news articles in late March in which a corrupt Ukrainian prosecutor attacked the ambassador? Well, we were concerned. We put out a statement that uh, some of these allegations are an outright fabrication as they related to the do not prosecute list. Right. And we began to discuss what we could do to deal with this matter. Right. And then the, the problems continued for Ambassador Yovanovitch. Uh, and as I understand it, she emailed you on March 24th and indicated that, quote, the tempo of social media and other criticisms were such that she felt she could no longer function unless there was a strong statement of defense of her from the debate, uh, State Department. Uh, is that correct? Correct. And this message, what, and Secretary Pompeo was aware uh, of her situation. Is that correct? Yes, I briefed him the next day. And he's the ultimate authority who could issue that strong statement of support, correct? Correct. Uh, but he never, ever did issue a statement, right? We did not issue a statement at that time. But in fact, you, as I, you testified around the same time that s the secretary did not render assistance to a long-serving and highly respected ambassador. He made two phone calls uh, to Rudy Giuliani. Is that right? Uh, it's correct that he, that I, I've seen a record that he made those phone calls. One on March 28th and again the next day on March 29th. I saw the record of that, yes. Right. So we don't know what he said to Rudy Giuliani, but we have a pretty good idea what Rudy, Rudy Giuliani said to him. Get rid of Yovanovitch. She was gone and the statement never came forward, right? Correct. And when she was recalled uh, and wanted to find out what happened, uh, Secretary Pompeo would not meet with her? Right. I was out of the country at the time. I can't comment on that. All right. Well, and then uh, Mr. Breckbuehl, who was next in line, didn't meet with her? I, I don't know this. Well, then it came for you to give her the news. It went to the, the deputy secretary, I believe, held the meeting. I was uh, in, on foreign travel at the time. Well, it would be interesting if we could have uh, Secretary Pompeo uh, be here uh, to t tell us uh, what his conversations were with Rudy Giuliani, the person who was uh, fomenting uh, the discontent about an ambassador who was fighting corruption. Uh, I want to thank you and I want to thank Ms. Cooper for your service. Mr. Maloney. Um, hello, Ms. Cooper. Hello, Secretary Hale. Um, Ms. Cooper, thank you for working late on a Wednesday. Um, I think the last time we attempted to hear your testimony, the Republicans were good enough to bring pizza. Um, down to the skiff, uh, but uh, kidding aside, I, um, I know we de detained you for about five hours that day, so on behalf of uh, the committee, thank you for your forbearance. We do appreciate your patience with us. Uh, quick question um, uh, for you, and, and I think just one question for you, Secretary Hale. Um, uh, Ms. Cooper, was DOD able to uh, put all the security system funds into contract before the end of the fiscal year? No, sir. And how much was, were they not able to obligate? Um, what was left unobligated? 
I believe the figure was 35 million. It's, uh, we were able to actually obligate 88% total. And I think you mentioned that you were able, because of legislation, the Congress passed continuing resolution to do that. Is that right? So the remainder, we are in the process of obligating me, right now the because of the, uh, the provision in the continuing resolution. Right. So, it, but for a, literally an act of Congress, you couldn't have spent all the money. If we had not received the provision in uh, the continuing resolution, uh, we would have uh, obligated 88%, but not the full amount. Right, which of course um, would be a violation of law to not spend money that Congress appropriated. Sir, I am not a lawyer, but that is my understanding. Sure, um, thank you. Uh, Secretary Hale, where were you born? Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, and uh, is your family from Ireland? Am I no, right about that? No, sir. I'm sorry. Uh, strike it. Uh, another question. With respect to uh, Secretary Yovanovitch, um, you served as ambassador to, I believe, three countries? Correct. Uh, Jordan? Jordan, Lebanon, Pakistan, and Pakistan. Lebanon? And uh, while you were ambassador to those three countries, did anyone ever ask you to uh, issue a, a support praising personally, the President of the United States? No. How would you have viewed such a request? It would depend on the situation, sir. If someone said, say you went to someone and you were having a problem with your job and you said, how can I do better? And they said you should publish something personally praising the President, flattering to him. Um, would that strike you as unusual? Yes. If someone told you to go big or go home, would that change your mind? I don't quite understand the... Well, that's what Ambassador uh, Yovanovitch was treated to when she went to Ambassador Sondland seeking advice. That, and, and she declined to do so. I believe she said it would strike her as too political. Is that consistent with the approach you, the approach you might take? I thought that sounds sensible, yes. Thank you. Uh, you yield the remaining time back to the Chairman. Thank you both for being here. Ms. Demings. Ambassador Hale, Ms. Cooper, thank you both for being with us. Just a quick question before I uh, get into some questions about Ambassador Sondland, who we heard from today. I want to ask both of you, if President Trump uh, withheld critical military aid from Ukraine because high-ranking officials supported the president's political opponent, would you consider that an official, acceptable, appropriate action by the president of the United States? Ambassador Hale? It's not what I would advise. Ms. Cooper? No, that does not sound appropriate. Ambassador Hale, you testified that you were aware Ambassador Sondland was involving himself in matters that, and I quote, went beyond the normal wit, writ of, the, of an ambassador to the European Union, unquote. As you understood it, who authorized Ambassador Sondland to work on Ukraine? I have no firsthand knowledge of that. I received a readout from a meeting that the President of the United States had with the delegation on May 23rd in which the briefing I received anyway indicated that the President wanted the members of that delegation, which included Ambassador Sondland, to carry forth the policies that were discussed in the course of that meeting. So that occurred in a meeting in the Oval Office on May 23rd is where you heard that information from the readout of that a, meeting? A written readout from that, yes. You testified that, and I quote, it was clear that the members of that inaugural delegation were empowered by the president. That's what you testified. You also said, and I quote, as a practical matter, it would be Ambassador Volker and Ambassador Sondland, presumably working with Taylor, who would be the ones really doing the continual effort here. Did you understand that Ambassador Sondland had direct access to the president? I, in the few occasions in which I had conversations with Ambassador Sondland, he often would let it know that he was in direct contact with the president. That's all I knew. 
So you received that information directly from Ambassador Sondland that he had direct contact with the president? In previous occasions, yes, not, not related to this particular matter. Is there anything about Ambassador Sondland's role that struck you as problematic? Based on what I knew at the time, I was satisfied that this delegation was what the president wanted to have, you know, continue to pursue these policies. And I saw that Ambassador Volklin, who was a professional, had been a foreign service officer and an ambassador of distinction, um, and steeped in Ukrainian affairs, was part of that group. So I had no great concerns. So what you knew at the time, you were okay with his role, but did uh, your opinion change about his, the appropriateness of his role? As I testified, I was not aware of these various activities related to negotiations over investigations, preconditions related to that. I just wasn't aware of it, so I had no reason to be making any kind of judgment one way or the other. Have you reviewed the text messages between Ambassadors Sondland and Volker? I've seen some of them that were reported in the media. Were you surprised by anything in those messages that you heard reported or personally witnessed or observed? I was surprised by what I saw in those reports in the media. I want to ensure I understand your testimony, Ambassador Hale. You believed Ambassador Sondland was empowered by the president according to what you found out from the May 23rd meeting to work on Ukraine policy, and you said, quote, none of that really struck you as problematic because of the time differences there of what you knew. Is that correct? Based on what I knew, yes. Okay. You are the Under Secretary for Political Affairs. You testified that in that capacity, you are responsible for the management of the United States bilateral relations with, and I quote, every country in the world that we recognize for the management of our policies towards those countries, as well as our relationship or policies as they relate to multilateral organizations. Does that include U.S. policy and relations with Ukraine? It does, but when we have a special envoy who reports directly to the secretary related to a country or an issue, that special envoy will take the day-to-day -day responsibilities. How about U.S. policy and relations with the European Union? Yes, I am. But you were not aware fully of Ambassador Sondland's activities on behalf of President Trump? That's correct. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield back. Mr. Krishnamurthy. Good evening. Thank you so much for being here. Um, Under Secretary Hale, uh, you and your colleagues testified that you've gathered official records at the State Department with the understanding that they would be provided to Congress, right? I was not involved in the decision making or I have no responsibilities related to gathering documents. I understood that it was underway. And I, I certainly received the documents that I described earlier. I see. Um, in terms of the materials that were collected, uh, do they include electronic files and emails, for instance? I can only speak to the documents that were made available to me, and it did include emails. And uh, paper documents as and well? And paper documents. Um, would tape recordings potentially be uh, among the files that are gathered? I really couldn't uh, speculate uh, on that. Yeah. But you can't rule out that possibility? I don't, I don't know of tape recordings, but I, so I can't really comment on that. And uh, are you familiar with um, uh, from whom the documents have been collected, like the individual custodians? I don't know that, sir. Um, you're aware that uh, despite a duly authorized congressional subpoena has been served on the State Department, we have yet to receive even a single document, correct? I'd, I understand that, yes. Uh, Ms. Cooper, um, in the interagency process, um, did anyone in any committee uh, uh, potentially bring up uh, the lack of allied funding as a reason for why there should be a hold on military assistance to Ukraine? I can only speak to the three uh, meetings that I attended, the, the PCC, DSG, and then PCC, and I have no recollection of the issue of allied burden sharing coming up at that point. I did provide information in my deposition about a, 
what I thought was a completely separate query that I received in mid-June uh, from the Secretary of Defense's front office. And one of the questions there uh, just asked a question about the degree to which uh, allies were contributing to Ukraine security assistance, just to be very clear. Okay, but after the hold was put in place on July 18th, you, did, you haven't heard any concerns about a lack of allied funding uh, as a reason for why the hold should be in place? In those meetings that I attended, I did not hear that, or I do not recall hearing that as a reason. The only reason that I Got heard it. was uh, the president's views on corruption. No further information. Got it. Same question to you, Under Secretary Hill. Could you repeat the question, sir? I assume you didn't hear about the lack of allied funding as a, as a reason for the hold being put in place after July 18th. No, I never heard a reason for the hold. You never, I, I assume neither of you heard any reason whatsoever for why the hold was in place, except for the fact that OMB put it in place at the direction of the president, right? That's, that's correct. And I, I assume, you know, one of my colleagues brought up the idea that the hold was put in place to assess whether or not President Zelensky was legit. I assume that was not a, uh, a reason that was offered either. No, sir, I never heard that as a reason. I heard no reason. Um, Under Secretary Hale, what is the importance of a world leader having a meeting at the White House? Well, really, it's case by case, but um, particularly for a new leader, it's an extremely important opportunity to demonstrate the strength of our relationship for uh, building of that relationship at a personal level, leadership level, to demonstrate common goals. How about in the case of President Zelensky? Um, how important was it for him to have this white, uh, a meeting at the White House with President Trump? Well, I never talked to President Zelensky about that myself. I met him before he became president. I met with President Poroshenko and the two leading candidates. But uh, as an expert uh, on these matters, uh, is it fair to say that uh, a, a new world leader such as President Zelensky having a meeting at the White House with President Trump is extremely important for uh, his image that he projects, especially toward folks like uh, Russia? Well, an Oval Office meeting is incredibly valuable for any foreign leader. Let me just state that general principle. And for a Ukrainian president, it is indeed what you just said to demonstrate that the bond between the United States and Ukraine is strong and that there is continuity in our policies and that we are going to continue to work together on our policy goals, including countering Iran, uh, Russian aggression and intimidation of Ukraine. Thank you so much. Mm. I yield back. That concludes the member questioning.